on a different channel. Um, so I want to make sure we're on the right channel. So I want to thank you all for being tolerant with us. And um, hey, it's about to be a new year and we're still trying to get this thing together. But again, my name is Dr. Willie Miles. I am the president of Dr. Willie Miles Children's Foundation located in Atlanta, Georgia. And I really want to sort of like thank you all for being faithful followers of us for an entire, some of you all have been doing this for two years now. And we're just very excited. We're very excited about us being able to get information out to you that will hopefully help you and your families and the whole goal is to make this world just a better place for everyone, for everyone. Again, I'm really hoping that each of you all had a great holiday. Um, and I share with you that I did. I did. I'm happy that we're about <laughs> bringing it to the end. You know, these holidays are, are joyous for us, for us and it's exciting getting family and friends together. But it also requires a lot of work, a lot of work. I'm not sure about you all, but this is just a couple of days after Christmas and I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, but I'm getting excited for the new year, for the new year. I do want to say that here in Atlanta, the weather is kind of strange, folks. We're at like 60 and 70 degrees in December, in December. So again, I'm not complaining. I'm loving every minute of it, loving every minute of it. So our co-host will be on shortly, Jackie, and she made me aware that she's going to be running just a little late. Um, but I think I, I think I think I can cover it until she gets on. What do you all think? All right. So I do want to make you all aware that um, from the foundation, we were able to help about five families, which equates to about 20 children for the Christmas holidays. I want to thank each of you all who gave to make that possible. I want to thank each of you all who gave to make that possible. And it's all about, you know, pulling together community resources to make sure that those who are less fortunate can also enjoy the things that we enjoy, that we enjoy. And I hear some of y'all saying, well, guess what? I'm less fortunate too. But I always tell folk that there's always someone who would like to be in your shoes. You're just still so blessed and have so much, even in your lack. Even in your lack, you're still just so blessed. So again, I'm just happy to be on this side of the ground. And we have, I think, two, I mean, three more days before the new year comes in. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, Saturday. We have three or four more days before the new year comes in. And I'm very excited about the new year. Uh, before I get into the night's topic, I do want to make you all aware of, of just some holiday, uh, cu cultural holidays. Of course, we just had Christmas and um there is a the holiday that starts after Christmas that was started by Dr. Milana Karenga, and he penned uh, these values um, in 1966 when they were first published. But it's called the Nguzo Saba. It's called the Nguzo Saba, which are the second principle, the seven principles of Kwanzaa. The seven principles of Kwanzaa, and the Kwan Kwanzaa was designed to bring black people together with a common set of values to help promote their well-being. And so this is part of our education process and this is uh, what we do. We are here to educate everyone. So we're now in the season of Kwanzaa and Kwanzaa starts the day after Christmas and there are seven principles. The first principle, which was on, on Sunday, it was the first day after Christmas, which was called um, Ujima, Umoja. Umoja. And I said, because Ujima is the next day. Umoja. That means to strive toward unity. To strive toward unity. All right. On Monday, that day was called Kuchitagalia, which means self-determination. Now, just be reminded that these values, these principles are designed to help promote Black people to be the best they can be and not give up and to, cons to also... Um, have them consider, consider the value of collective work and responsibility. On Wednesday, so today we're celebrating Kujichagalia. On Wednesday, which tomorrow is Ujima, which is collective work and responsibility. And the whole goal is to build and maintain a community that's worthy for everyone. On Thursday is Ujima, which is cooperative economics, which simply means to spend money with people of color to make sure that you are uh, um, um, planning for your economics and you're not just spending every dime you get. Also on Friday is called Nia. That's the principle of Nia, which is purpose. And all of us should have a purpose. All of us should have a purpose. Saturday, 
which is, I'm sorry, Friday is um, Kuamba, okay? And Saturday is faith. Saturday is faith. So those are the second principles of Kwanzaa. And the seven principles are um, called the Nguzo Saba, the Nguzo Saba. So now that you've had your lesson on um, the uh, Black Holiday, and it was originated in, in, in the United States by Dr. Melana Karanga. Um, and there are no spiritual ties to it. So there's no, oh, celebrate Kwanzaa instead of uh, Christmas. You know, that's not what it's all about. It's really about uh, bringing together culture people to work for toward a common good, to work toward a common good. But again, I'm glad to be here tonight. And folks, guess what? Almost 2022, almost 2022. And when you look at last year, we were just trying to get through the year. Last Christmas, we're worried about the, the, uh, the coronavirus, and we still are very concerned about the, the um, other viruses that are out. But we're very concerned. We didn't make any movements, didn't go anywhere, just not living in fear, but we were just very cautious. And this year, we were things began to open up for us, and we began to be a little bit more open. For a matter of fact, folk, I actually had guests over for Thanksgiving and had guests over for a holiday social. So I was really out there. I was really having fun. So at any rate, um, I was very cautious, and I wanted to make sure that all my guests had, had their vaccinations and not only the vaccinations, but also those who had the boosters. And so we maintain social distancing also. So again, just be careful, folks. Be, be cautious out there. Don't, I mean, uh, again, no one can tell you what to do, uh, but I say use your best judgment. And let's just try to keep all of us, let's try to keep all of us alive. That's the most important thing. But again, I want to thank my, uh, our Facebook live watchers and also our um, Instagram folk for faithfully watching us every week. Now we thought we're not going to be on this week because we said, let's take the whole, Jackie and I said, let's take the whole holiday off. <laughs> let's just take the holiday off. But we decided that it would be most important that we just get information out to you uh, about this season and some things that happen to families during the holiday season. You all may me recall a couple of weeks ago, we did a uh, holiday depression, you know, holiday depression. And we should say holiday moods. Because it's not only depression, it's anxiety and a whole bunch of other um, uh, um, uh, emotions that were involved during the holidays. So again, um, we, I don't want to come, out, come across so heavy tonight, but it is a heavy conversation. And it deals with child molestation and communications. And, and the reason I chose that topic for right after Christmas, because it's kind of amazing that the number, uh, the, the, the ratio of abuses occur during the holidays, during the holidays. You know, the holidays are supposed to be a time of joy. It's supposed to be a time of, of us getting family together. It's supposed to be a time where we're celebrating each other. But for some people, they end up being victims. They end up being victims. So uh, we're talking about the importance of parental communications. Now we've had a topic like this very similarly months ago and we found out some parents don't feel comfortable talking to their children i mean with any conversation other than giving directions but i think it's critically important uh my folk that that you establish a communication with your child so they feel comfortable in talking to you and not being embarrassed talking to you they feel comfortable talking to you talking to you about anything because you as a parent ready you're not going to be judgmental. <laughs> you're going to be an active listener. You are not going to be judgmental. You're going to be an active listener. And that's what parents do. You know, oftentimes parents who are not aware think that their job is just to give instructions. Do what I say do and, you know, uh, stay in a child's place, you know, to be uh, seen and not heard. Well, that's not quite true. And that's where a lot of this stuff goes untalked about. You know, I think it's so interesting that parents don't feel comfortable in talking to their children about any conversation. And children don't feel comfortable talking to their parents about sensitive conversations. If a child can't talk to his parent 
about sensitive stuff. Well, you call it sensitive. I just call it life. What is the purpose of the parent other than to provide the food and shelter? But the parents are also responsible for the child's psychological and emotional well-being. Their psychological and emotional well-being. So let's jump into the topic tonight. And the topic is communications, its impact, or the lack of impact on molestation. You know, I like to always give y'all some background first on the topic. And it usually ends up with, when you know, it starts with data. You know, I'm, I'm so like data driven. I, I want y'all to know the severity of the stuff we're talking about every week. Every week we talk. Every week, I give you background information so that you can be aware of what's happening out there. When it comes to child molestation, there are more than 42 million survivors in the United States. I will say it again. In the United States, there are more than 42 million survivors of sexual abuse. And you ask yourself, how could that be happening in this civilized society that we're in? You know, you know what causes it? You know, and 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 if there are that many survivors, my question is, how many didn't survive? How many did not survive? Now I know this is a heavy topic for after Christmas, <laughs> but I want to make sure that. The information was out there. I want to make sure that the information um, you're getting is going to be able to help you, help you in your ministries, help you as you be become a child advocate, help you all the way around, help you all the way around. There are 42 million survivors. There are more than 42 million survivors of sexual abuse in the United States. One in three girls are sexually abused before the age of 18. Hi, Jackie. I'm glad you were able to get on. Good evening, Dr. Miles. I'm happy to join you as well. I'm uh, coming in from a remote location, so... I was going to ask you, I said, where are you? I hope you're not like... Uh, uh, head up to the moon. I mean, I'm trying to get in outer space because I didn't do too well. Yeah, no, I wanted to make sure I was on tonight, so I just stopped and joined. Okay, no problem. But Jackie, I was giving our audience this information that there are more than 42 million, there are more than 42 million survivors of sexual abuse in the United States. And my comment was that if there are more than 42 million survivors, how many did not survive? Wow, and that, of course, that 42 million is staggering. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the reasons, you know, um, we talked about this particular show and mentioned that it would be difficult, but um, those numbers make this so important. Yeah. You know. And, and, and Jack, it's not just for you to me, you know, the data says more than. So we don't have any specifics on this specific number, but they give us a generalized number, which is a 42 million. And I'll give you some further data. One in three girls are sexually abused before the age of 18. One in five boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. And one in five children are solicited sexually while in, on the internet before age 18. And the data goes on to share that more than 90% of the per uh, perpetuators are known by the victims and known by the families. So when yeah, we said, oh, I'm sorry. And, and what that's also telling us, Dr. Miles, is that our children, uh, when we talk about before the age of 18, it means our children are not able to grow up without the fear. You know, one in five, of course, is, is, a, is you know, 20%. That's a big number. Um, and one in three uh, is 33. So that's a large percent of our children that just aren't able to grow up without this particular um, um, assault. And, and this type of abuse. We know it's what's the thing, Jackie. Thirty percent of these cases are unreported, and what happens is that the reason children and and, and and teens don't report it is for fear of judgment from parents. From parents, probably from, pa from the perpetrators, 
um, you know. I, I want to bring it back now. It's, it's from parents. We're not talking about the rest of the people. They don't tell anybody. They don't talk about it for fear that they're going to be judged. I mean, I'm saying, and I'm saying, I was saying, if they can't talk to the parents about this stuff, you know, like. Right. Then if they can't talk to the parents, they're probably not speaking to anyone. And we know that is the case. Right. Um, that, that also says that perhaps these conversations need to take place in, um, within the educational system more so that, you know, uh, victims do feel comfortable reporting it. And, you know, we know it's very common for victims to feel that they may have played a role, that there may be something they did mm -hmm. um, to cause it. So that is probably also contributing to why they fear their parents' judgment. Well, and, and I think the, the other part to it is that when I say they fear parents' judgment, that concerns me because my question is, what kind of communication do the parents have with their children? And it, what kind do they have? Are are they not having any other than giving you know parental instructions? You know, you and I had a show in the past talking about parents and their lack of comfort and talking about sensitive matters. Um, and it's actually, I think, um, a little broader. I think it's parents having a, a a full and comprehensive understanding of what parenting is, because mm -hmm. very often we do think it's feed them clothe them and put a roof over their head and and i'm good put them in school i'm good and so there's so much more to this well of course the data is not going to show this right here but in, in the cases that i treat jackie the women report ready mm -hmm. told their mother and did nothing about it yes yes very common and what's interesting about that we often see that played out um in movies um, because, you know, um, art imitating life. Um, and that is a very common scenario where young women have told their mothers that, you know, they've been molested by a family member, by a partner, even a, a parent. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not being believed, which honestly is just, Staggling. you know, uh, uh, difficult to understand. A child well is not born, you know, and, and, and thinking, especially at younger ages, of, of this as something to make up. So just horrific. Well, you know, the thing about it is that we can understand it. We'll have to accept it. Because what some of these parents deal with Jackie is that if I put him out, I lose all the finances. Or if I put her out, I lose all the finances. Bills don't get paid. And or, oh, if she didn't, if she didn't have a dress on that was so short, it wouldn't have happened. Or if he wasn't around. So um, my point is that we sometimes, parents make excuses while their children are being Suffer. harmed. But at that point, Dr. Miles, we also know that we are not dealing with mentally stable parents. Um, again, a very common theme throughout our, our, um, our workshops and, and throughout our uh, broadcast, that parent parental wellness is... Uh, responsible for a lot of things that our children are dealing with. You know, what, what I'm going to do, because when you said that, you know, I, I was saying that I want to be careful that we don't become judgmental. For instance, when we said that the parents are not mentally stable, it really is based upon our own judgment. I'm just saying they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the knowledge and, and the survival skills. Are, are you with me? And the I am, but Dr. Miles, I don't think we're judging. We are looking at behaviors. Mm -hmm. And those behaviors, as you, me, anyone, our behaviors are an indicator of whether or not we are mentally stable. So, but I do hear you. We do want to be careful not to judge. But, you know, we, we come at this from an educational and a clinical uh, perspective. And it's just yeah. reality. And, and I'll, again, I'm not going to go, but I, but I do want to, I want to say this, right. is that people have used um, judgments against people of color so long. And that's why I'm so like cautious Understood. about what we call it. Because, because I don't know, don't mean I am mentally stable. Or, it, right. or because I am in a survival mode, you know. Right, that's so, true. And I was yes. going to say, we do know for sure that it, it is a lack of knowledge, a lack right. of awareness. Right. So we know that and, and we agree on that. 
But the thing we have to t take a look at, though, is that when children have parents who are that way, so are the kids safe? You know, when we have parents who look at their needs, yeah. <laughs> their right. needs versus the harm that's being done to their child, and then they'll say something like, they'll grow out of it. They'll grow out of it, but I also did it to protect that same child. You know, I needed to, as you said, put a roof over that child's head, and right. it was necessary. And, of course, you and I both agree that that is poor. Okay, so, again, I'm still giving some background, some data, that 90% um, of child sexual abuse victims know the perpetrator. Did they, you say 90%? 90% of, of child victims know the perpetrator. That's shocking. Approximately 20% of the victims of sexual abuse are under the age of eight. Approximately 20% of the victims of sexual abuse are under the age of eight. Insanity, but of course, at an age where their victimization is easier. Well, you know, and, and I would say, what well, I must okay. You said, well, let's say easier, but where the parents are more trusting to leave their children with just anybody, you know. And I'm not gonna say anybody because many people are family members, so it's not just anybody they're leaving them with. Exactly. And and this whole topic is dealing with communications or lack thereof, and the impact that it has on molestation. And so if children are not talking about it and, and, and have a sense of comfort without the parents saying, you know, some, and we'll get to this later on, the things you should not do. To my, oh, I'm going to kill them, you know. Oh, so what, that, what, that ha what happens, it, 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 it makes this situation worse. Right. And, and, and honestly, thinking from the victim's standpoint, when the person harming you is a person known to you, and at that point, we'd have to assume it's a person that is trusted or else you would not have been, you know, the child wouldn't have been left with them. Imagine the, the emotional turmoil on that child. You know, they're afraid of, of break, breaking relationships between the parent and that person. Again, blaming themselves, just a whole barrage of issues and reasons around why those situations are not being reported. Well, let's, let's start with the, the reality of it, too. It's not just a matter of... Uh, who the parent dropped a child off with, right? It is the kids sleeping in the same bed with relatives. You know, it is um, sometimes economics where we got five people living in a one bedroom apartment and all the right. kids sleep together and the older brother's molesting the child while they're in the bed with them. Right, right. And, and so so what we're trying, we're trying not to, to cause this, oh, it's, we gotta be so protective, you know, you know. But the point is, if your children are able to talk to you, <laughs> right. at least you know the information. And Jackie, I'm not talking about the child stays so rubbing. Did they touch you? They rub you? No, no. We're not talking about and, that. And Dr. Miles, let's also add in early, you know, um, training of children. Yes. I'm talking two and three year olds. You start talking. No one should touch you here. Yes. You know, if anyone does, you should tell me right away. You have the right to say no. I mean, right. let's train our children very early on, you know, as a, you know, a means of trying to protect them. I agree totally. I agree totally. And everything we're talking about, Jackie, really comes under the realm of communications. Communications and intentional parenting. Parent on purpose, you know, be deliberate. Uh, and as a parent, these are things you have to think about. They're things you think about from the time that child is born. They're not things you think about when they get five or 10 or start going to school. You know, you have to know the information. 90%, that's again, why these sessions are so important. 90% are people known to them. So parents should know this. So if 90% right. of, of victims are molested by people they know, parents have to be diligent. You, we can't put our head in the sand and go, oh, but not my family. And you not, can't. Not the people I know. You, 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 you can't guard them out of this. The only way you can actually deal with this from a prevention point of view is 
by having an established relationship, communication relation with your child. And you know, Dr. Miles, that connects to one of our other uh, broadcasts where we talked about using appropriate terminology with your children. Right. You know, describing body parts, talking about, you know, what, what it means to be private and, and what your rights are and where you should and should not be touched by anyone. Do you understand? So again, these conversations start early and they can prevent a lot of uh, misunderstanding and a lot of, of, of trauma, you know, later in, in the right. child's life as the child goes up. Well, Jackie, you know, we're, we're actually quoting what the data says because the data says that 95% of sexual abuse is preventable through education. Preventable through education. That it's says it all. And it means we need to do another, you know, broadcast. We've and, and I'm, I'm going to add, and I know that education means a broad spectrum of stuff, right. but I'm going to add through education and, communi and parental communication. I, I agree. Communication is key. And again, parents don't often talk to their children. Um, and I'm trying to think of the right terminology. Speak to their children in an educational <laughs> manner. I need to teach you this. I, I would need you to know this information. You know, check it, in one of our past, you know, lectures, you know, we talked about if you don't do it, who's going to do it? <laughs> if you don't do it, I mean. Well, one of the answers to that was that the wrong piece, the wrong people will do it. Exactly. Right. If you're not talking to your child, someone is. Check it. Here's another piece of data which is going to shock you. Because everybody thinks perpetrators are men trying to find people, trying to find little girls, right? But Correct. And of the sexual abusers of boys are females. Give me those numbers again. 38% of the sexual abusers of boys are females. Well, I think that's probably going to shock a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's almost 40%, uh, which is certainly a significant number. And let's face it, Dr. Miles, you don't hear about female abusers very often. Yeah, you know, of course, what we're, what we're doing, Jackie, we're, we're, we're sort of like recapping what we talked about the year. But we said that the reason that men don't report their domestic violence victims, and we're going to also add sexual victims, is because of this thing of masculinity, because of this thing of male, this doesn't happen to males, and who's going to believe it, first of all? Well, and also because I think what you're saying is we're very comfortable sexualizing our young boys at an early age under the, exactly. you know, under the auspices of masculinity. But Jackie, guess what? We're comfortable we, with it. We ain't talking about no teen boys. We, we, we're talking about children. I know. I have and honestly, I know of people, of, of men, who have shared that they had these experiences. Just shocking. But no. again... Jackie, when you say you have men who share they have the experience, I mean that women have molested them? that their female yeah. babysitters molested them as yeah. early as seven, eight. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have, and, and, and in treatment, I have those same kind of, I have the same clients. And Jackie, that's why I want to bring this up because it's sort of like as an advocate for those who are in treatment. Because what I'm seeing is the adult outcome of child molestation. And if it had occurred much earlier, one, it could have been preventable, and two, the, 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 the person, the child, would have been able to manage, you know, the trauma. Are you with me? Because they never get over, they, they're able to manage the trauma. So for those who just came in, um, Dr. Willie Miles out of Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with Dr. Willie Miles Children's Foundation, and my colleague, my um, co-host is Jackie Clements, Hampton Clements, who's out of Florida, who is an educator, and is the president of Valley of the Giants. Yes. Good evening again, everyone. Hi. So, Dr. Miles, again, this is a societal issue. Yes. And um, I think in that regard, our parents are often not supported in it because I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about the parents who are trying to fight it and the parents yeah. who do approach it and, and the struggles they have. Well, you know, when we talk, when we, Jackie, when we get the data, we talk about um, the lasting effects. And those who've been watching me for years know that my big thing is about dealing with traumas and traumas untreated, traumas untreated. And we know the effect of traumas untreated. And for children who have been molested, 
and who have not received the proper treatment, it can cause all kinds of problems as they get older. But Jackie, the worst is for the child who's been molested, who's under, uh, before the age of six. Right. And if you recall, go ahead, you were finishing a thought. No, go on. No, go on. If you recall at one of our workshops, we had a session on um, traumas untreated show up in adult life. Right. And we, you know, we've also, you know, know the statistics on that being very uh, common and prevalent. So it's not something that just goes away. It's Jackie, a lifelong, and sometimes it becomes a cycle and repeats itself in the next generation. And that, therein lies the danger and why it is so important to get a, you know, get a hold of this information, share this information, and, and seek to, to reduce and eliminate this sort of abuse. Well, Jackie, you know what's amazing, though? It becomes a cycle if the person doesn't commit suicide. So that's, the data is showing that many uh, children who grow with this trauma, but Jackie, I, I want you to help me keep this because I don't want this to become a child abuse workshop. This is really about parental communication. It is about parental communication. You know, yes. man, you, you and I have talked about this forever. You know, so this is not a repeat of child abuse. That is not, that is not the case, folks. We're right. talking about parents. What are parents doing to prevent? Are they talking to their children? Um, again, at early ages. And Dr. Miles, I don't think we could ever say that too much. Right. At early ages. And when we say early, we do mean three. You know, by, by two and three, you should be talking to your child about their private parts, using appropriate terminology, explaining certain things, because again, this abuse is happening at those ages. Jackie, 42% of those young people who are molested attempt suicide during adolescence. Wow. Again, at an early age. Wow. Cause they ain't talking to nobody. And no one's understanding or believing. Also, as we've mentioned, we don't believe in therapy. Um, I had a recent situation um, of a young man who took his life at the age of 26. Um, and preventable because he could have gotten, you know, therapy. The father felt that he's an adult. He'll handle it. He doesn't need our help. The mother knew there was issues. The insurance didn't cover it and they didn't feel that they could pay for it out of pocket. I mean, when I tell you to move some things and, and switch some expenses or eat bologna for a month, whatever it takes, we, I go these, vegan. again, are things that we have to promote. I mean, things that we have to get the word out. When your child is having an issue, you can't afford not to get that help. We're giving you this real broad paintbrush of this issue. People, please keep in mind, we're giving the broad spectrum of the, this broad paintbrush because we want y'all to start talking. We didn't say fussing, we didn't say threatening, we didn't say instilling fear in these children. We said establishing positive communication, establishing communications where your kids can come to you for refuge and for security. Um, check another p interesting piece of data says that 90% of individuals with a developmental disability will be assaulted at least once in their life. I've heard those numbers as well. Again, communication and, and the uh, attackers believe that that child, one, won't communicate or can't communicate, and two, if and when they do, they won't be believed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so again, as a parent of someone with uh, a disability that falls in that category, then again, extreme diligence um, has to take place. Means of communication. Right. Uh, communicating with caregivers. You know what? It, it really requires, Dr. Miles, and people don't like this, but you almost have to just be on the lookout. Like, as that child's caregiver, you have to look for every sign. You have to, you know, almost guilty until proven innocent in anything that is out of line. But well, you have to be paying attention. The other thing, too, you need to know your child. <laughs> you need to well, know. You need to know. You your, know right. 
you know your child's behaviors and when those behaviors change folks that's it's key dr miles if you don't know the behavior in the first place you don't notice the change but that exactly. is a very important point you've got to know your child you gotta know their moods you gotta know their expressions uh this is very interesting though that there are nearly half a million registered sex offenders in the united states but 80 to 100,000 of them are missing. So people don't know where they are. Now, what I don't want to do is paint this brush that these are sex offenders who uh, you're the only ones. You know, those are the ones who've gotten caught. Right. And of the half a million, 20%, because... right, 40 to 20% of them are quote unquote missing, meaning we don't know where they are. So, Jack, you know, society, law what enforcement. What do? They'll say, listen, I got to watch out for the perpetrators, but while I'm looking for them, you keep my child. Not realizing that it's the perpetrator. <laughs> and it's not going to be. It's not going to be. You know something else that brings up Dr. Miles? Yeah. Keep your own child 99% of the time. Well, you know. Make those sacrifices. Okay, let, let, no, let, 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 let's be real. You know, what we don't want to do is create a hysteria. We, what we don't want to do is do that. What we want to do is encourage parents to establish communications. Communications will solve all of this. Because you, 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 you can't put a brick wall around the child to keep it from happening. You, you can't be so paranoid, whereas I don't trust nobody. Well, you know, I'm, so I'm going to be honest. I, you know, as a parent, I can tell you that in, in this case, my husband and I started with that rule and then you 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 find the exceptions to the rule. But I hear what you're saying, and you can't. Your child is going to have another caregiver. Your child is going to go to school. Your child is not with you, you know, 100% of the time. Right. To your point, it is about being diligent, communicating, observing, knowing your child well enough to know when they're a little bit right. different. Right. You know, and something's happened. And again, having the kind of relationship that when it does, that they will even share it with you. Of course. You know, and, you know, this thing about, I don't talk to my parents because I'm scared of them. You know, I don't talk to my mom because I did, because they ain't got time and they ain't interested. That is a perfect setup, not just for, for abuse. Us, but for and, abuse, period. Right. And when you think about the fact that 90% of people they know could be a person that actually heard them say that. Could be a person that ex heard them say, I don't really talk to my parents. They don't have time. You know, obviously, if these are people close to them, then they're having conversations with them. They right. know your child. They know their moods, right? So, but, you know, again, you know, we, we were talking about um, all, we, we have a very large paintbrush of all ages of children, but it could be the little ones we understand. We understand sometimes they are trusting, especially with relatives. But as they get older, the whole point is that oftentimes what parents can give their children they'll find somebody else who is more understanding and it evolves into this kind of stuff. And so I think our, com our conversation keeps going back to parental responsibility. And the big word tonight is C, communication. communication. Mm -hmm. Establish communication with your child. And it's kind of like establishing a base, right? It's checking in every day. Right. Every single day. It's not it's how, not taking anything for granted. How was your how, how was school today? Did anything strange happening? Did anything good happen? Were any strange people around you? You'll have that kind of communication where it's not a uh listen, you better make some good grades. I don't want to hear about nothing else. And what happens, you don't hear about anything else. And pay attention to those that they're close to. Yeah. Right. An adult taking a particular interest in your child. Could be a good thing. I'm not like you said. We don't want to be paranoid, but we certainly want to understand that relationship. We want to be around. You know, we want to be part of that relationship. If there's an adult inside or outside of your family that takes a particular interest in your child, and has yeah. and has access. Well, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. We have this conversation again, and I'm getting nervous now because we're running out of time. I mean, you know, it's it's already. I got we got 20 more minutes, <laughs> but. Jackie, this reminds me of the conversation we had before in this broadcast. And it was that parents are invisible at school, right? And then we talked about how also parents are invisible at home. So what we're talking Correct. about tonight is just parents being invisible, period. Don't ask no questions. 
you know, everything is raising hell with the child. There's no question about, oh, he acting strange. You know why he acting strange? Because his tail just bad. Oh, uh, no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Dr. Miles, to, to your point, you know how early that starts, using that terminology with a child? Right? So think about now, you started that language with them as a toddler. He's just right. bad. Okay? So now as, as, as a, you know, as a, a three-year-old, four-year-old, when they're molested, if and hopefully you know that's fitting right into who you've already told them they are so again Jack, that's, they're not communicating with you because you told them that they're bad or this one jackie your tail so bad you deserve everything that happens to you mm. i just wouldn't ever tell my child that. that's trauma <laughs> you deserve Never. every you deserve everything that happens to you because you're a liar you deserve everything that happens to you because you ain't making good grades. You get you deserve everything that happens to you because you don't do what I tell you to do. Right. That's right. that's almost sealing a fate. And that's that's parents Jack, have to think. When we're talking about when we're talking about pedophilia, um, but pe pedophile, of course, we know what that is, but I think it's a little bit broader than that. And that is that they will commit this act. 117 times in a lifetime. Wow. That's a lot of abuse. And that's per person. It's one person. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. You know, it's, it's not one person. It's per no, son. I'm saying when you said 117 oh, yeah, times, person. you meant each yeah. pedophile. Exactly. One person okay. will do. And so, Jackie, I, I know, you know, you, you know, you and I have talked about this. The reason we're giving this information because I want to encourage parents to communicate with their children. Communicate. Not and, just... And be informed. Be an informed parent. You know, we pull this stuff every week, but this is stuff parents need to be pulling. You can't afford not to know this information. So again, I hope we have people on. I hope well, the people on go out and share this. Again, not to scare anyone only to protect our children, to protect our children. Let me just do this analogy, right? And I'm, I'm probably going to mess it up. You know, I'm not good at this kind of stuff. Now, we go on by that favorite car we want, right? We go on by that, the most expensive car we can find. Every day. We, we ride. Operation. We use the operations manual. We read it. We put the right kind of oil in it. We wash it three times a week. Uh, <laughs> slow, nobody won't hit it. You, know, you can't eat in the car. You can't, roll the, can't even touch the car. You know, you can't even look at the car. We do all of that for something we value. Audio just went out. I don't know if everyone else's did, if you can hear me. You're, can you hear me now? I, I hear can you. hear you now. All right. Right. So, my, so my, we, we do all of that for a car. We, we, we place our emphasis on things that we value. So that means that if I don't have that same kind of energy, the same kind of investment in my children, it sends a very strong message that... We don't value them. I don't value you. I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm going to finish the statement for you. It sends a message that they are not valued. And if it's not sending that message to society, it may very well be sending it to your, your child because they do observe those kind of things. They know where you spend your time, money, and energy. I got so much more stuff to go through, but I, I want to open it up to our audience. Are, are you all relating to us? And, and are, do you all have any experiences you want to share with us? Just put it in the text. Don't tell us all your business. But my point is, if you know people who know people, if you've heard these kind of things before, we want to get some feedback on if we're on the right page and if we're in your lane. All right, Jackie, I tell you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the time watcher. We have like, 10 more minutes, and I haven't even began to touch what I want. But I think the key is that our whole topic is about communications. I'm not, I can't say it enough. Parents communicating with their children. Parents establishing a relationship of trust with their children. Parents making sure their kids are able to talk to them about anything. Parents not being judgmental. Parents not saying, I knew it was going to happen to you. And in other words, you begin to blame the child. Right. And more importantly, and parents approaching this again i'm this is what i can't say enough at early ages i really think we're afraid to talk to our three-year-olds 
You know, we think we don't need to talk to our three-year-olds. We say, hey, I would never have them around anyone who would harm them, okay? Um, but they go to childcare every day. So, yes, communication is the word that we need everyone to walk away with tonight. And you have to know that hurt people hurt people. So if it's not talked about, the child who is molested, the probability of them, them becoming a molester is high. Well, you're talking about something now, Dr. Miles, that I'm sure no one wants to talk about. But the reality is that molesters are someone's child. Right, exactly. And we're probably molested. Now, what's interesting, people say, well, guess what? I don't care about them. Well, it's not caring about them. It's caring about the treatment for your child. The treat the impact. So you very much should care about them. And Jenka, I think, you know, even with therapeutic services, you know, we, we can do all, we, we can counsel you to life. But the best counselor is a caring parent mm -hmm. who shows the child self-approval, who, yes. who don't ask them how, you know, how you feeling. You know, d d d don't, don't say, well, guess what? You know, uh, I went through the same thing. Because that'd be the case. What you're saying then is that you went through it. So how did it happen to me if you went through it? Are you, are you with me? So right. how do we not prevent it? Your parents you use the word, use the word intentional a lot. But I also think that the conversation should be intentional and the vocabulary should be intentional. Yes. Let's, let's and, just... and, and again, <laughs> get educated. Don't, don't wing it. Get the facts. Understand the terminology. Uh, as you said, invest the time in that child the way you do in a car. You know, we research cars before we buy them. We, we check out what's, what's good. We want to know the mileage. We look at the history of the car if it's not new. We, we put a lot of time and energy into other things. So put that time and energy. Make the time to research it. Make the time to understand. Let's just get into real quickly... Um what happens when the child does not receive the treatment they need? Uh, the child, I'm going to say, just, start, just sum this up. He, he or she can develop many mental health issues, including post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, um, they would have behavioral and societal, they, they have, they'll, they'll have social anxiety, which means they don't want to be around people. They get around people and can't breathe. Uh, the signs of a child who has been abused the signs of one of the major symptoms of a child who's been abused is the child will not want to be engaged with people. He or she will stand on the outside of the circle and always looking in. So if you, if you have a child and you're always saying, come and join us, come and join us. I'm not saying they're abused, but I'm saying those are some indicators. And are the child who is overly aggressive. The child was once quiet, but now he's, he or she is overly aggressive. Those signs that something, not just not just sexual molestation, but something is happening, that something is happening. Those children develop very low self-esteem, if not treated. And they will begin to sexualize the behavior. And what that means is that children who are sexually molested do not really understand the sexual part of it. So they will then begin to do things sexually, act out mm -hmm. sexually. Right. And, you know, you often hear, um, even at young ages, that children who are molested turn around and molest even younger children. Because, you know, I'm, I'm guessing the psychology is that mm -hmm. it's seeking answers and understanding. And are, Jackie, they grew up, prostitution, all kinds of ill behaviors. So, um, we can talk about causation. Jackie, we can talk about, oh, what caused it? Right, uh, something which I'm not sure we'll ever fully understand. We, right, we, we we can talk about all that stuff, but the, but the real issue is why they could prevent it. Why they can tell you, right. or did they tell you, and you didn't respond? Right. Or did they tell you, and you were not actively listening? Mm -hmm. Or they tell you, and you are just not prepared to hear it, so you you're in denial. Exactly. Well, there are some things that we can do for children who have been, have gone through this and who are in treatment, who have received treatment. And the parents can play a very important role. And that role is not of sympathy. The role is not of, I'm going to kill them. The role is not, um, 
I can't get over this. And you say all this stuff in front of the child because that's something that exacerbates the problem. But it really is understanding, giving the child reassurance, letting the child know that you're there to protect them, knowing that, telling the child that, you know, um, and it's not even you apologizing because you didn't do it. But it's, it's getting support and giving support. Yeah. Right? And yeah, exactly. And the key though, Jackie, we, you know, we, we've mentioned two key factors. One is communicating. One is talking and the other is listening. One is talking, the other is listening. Don't over talk the victim. Listen to them. Listen to them. Because you can you can you can you can get a whole lot from the child by just listening but what they're feeling. Um, you can get a whole lot about how they think about themselves, their surroundings, and you can help them feel much better about not feeling guilty about what happened. Not having the guilt because they didn't do anything. They were victims. They were victims. So there are a lot of things that parents can do uh, to help children. And Jackie, as we talk about this, I keep looking at molestation, but it ain't just molestation. It's no. It's everything. Yeah. I mean, some of these things can even be verbal, especially when we're talking about young children. It could be being exposed to the wrong images, the wrong terminology. I mean, it's not just molestation. Jackie, I'm about to change our schedule. I'm, I'm talking about for next year. We're going to have to do a whole lot more on parental communication. We've got this many kids being molested. That, that's just on the molestation part. We ain't talking about how many go to jail. We're talking about how many. Right. Are, you, are you with right. me? Right. I am with you. So I'm the numbers that, are staggering. Right. We're going to have to have to do a whole lot more on getting parents comfortable with themselves. But it sounds like therapy to me. It is therapy, you know? Uh, and that's another thing to get parents comfortable with their own and their children. Um, you know, um, this is before and in the absence of abuse, right? Yep. Therapy, uh, your point, communication, relationship, right? The relationship is not just, I brought you in the world and I clothed you, but is there a relationship? How, you know, and I, I challenge some of our parents to ask their children simple questions if something happened would you tell me right and just get a response if something happened would you come to me and you know children even in their innocence my first time say no because i maybe i don't want to say no because you know you don't believe me when i tell you things right ask them that mean right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you know, I no yeah you may be upset with me you know, this tells me we need to do a whole lot more work, not just on uh, parental uh, engagement and parental communications, but I think that parents oftentimes only do what they know. And many of our parents are in the same situation. We got some parents listening at night who are victims and I ain't talk to nobody. We have parents on this call tonight, on this broadcast tonight, who are victims of child molestation, but haven't talked to anybody about it. So they're still not healed. And so what happens, they have their children and they become helicopter parents. The child they can't- They become helicopter parents or if their children are abused, then they feel a level of guilt because they did not, you know, um, deal with their own. And they, you know, so many different, um, you know, scenarios there. Right. But again, I think all of our um, broadcasts have an undertone of parenting. Yes. Mm -hmm. What type of parent are you? Um, are you that active, intentional parent? And communication is a huge part of that. And it just touches so many areas of a child's life and right. development. But parents. When a parent is or is not. You're never too old to learn. The only time you stop learning is when you're dead. So you're always able, you're always able to learn additional information.
And especially if that information is going to help you protect your children. Absolutely. Well, that, it's that magic hour. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, Parents, we hope we've been a blessing to you. Jackie, I was saying that um, we're going to be on next week, but there'll be a new year by then. Oh, my goodness. That's true. It 2022. Be a, so I try, to, I try to dress up a little bit. I put a tuxedo shirt on with, with a cardigan. I don't know where I got it from, but I just want to look halfway celebratory tonight. As, as we close <laughs> out the year. So I do. And, and I'm wearing my black and my pearls, so... <laughs> I will I, see you on the other side, Dr. Miles. Which other side? The other side of 2021. Oh, let's clear that up because I'm not. I, I want to go home, but I ain't ready to go right now. But <laughs> I do want to thank our audience for being with us throughout the entire 2021. It's been a ride, folks. And it has. Jackie and I are just excited about bringing this information to you. And, folks, we do it every week faithfully and intentionally. And, and, and I've, I've got to plug this for parents too. Don't be selfish. You know other parents who need this information. You, your, your children have friends. You don't have to, you know, uh, uh, push them to come, but at least share that Jeff, this is available. We ought to be having Tell a your friends. viewers. We ought to be having a thousand viewers. Let's see what these people do. They'll hear what I'm going to say, and they'll go and pay somebody else fifteen thousand dollars for therapy. I'm saying <laughs> they come to us. They're getting it free every week. Absolutely. And, 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 and our workshops are very often, and Dr. Miles, maybe we need to say that and consider that, sometimes it's good for your children, especially your older children, to listen right. and be aware of this as well and join this conversation. And so, by the way, we also train foster parents with these sessions. So again, uh, family we, have, time. we have one more minute. Hey, listen, folks, happy new year to y'all. Be safe. Be safe. Happy new year, Dr. Miles. Happy new year, everyone. Great. It's been a ride. We'll see you. Good Take care, everybody. Good night.